Welcome to Communication is Key, Understanding Kubernetes Networking. My name is Jeff Poole. This is a tutorial, so it'll be hands-on. You can either watch me as I work, or I'll give you the instructions so that you can uh, try to work along with me. Kubernetes is a distributed system, so it relies heavily on networking, like all distributed systems. But Kubernetes is also very pluggable. You can change all sorts of things about it, including the networking plugins. You can change whether it uses IP tables or uh, eBPF. There's all sorts of uh, knobs that you can tune in Kubernetes in terms of the networking stack, which makes it even more complicated than a normal distributed system that has fairly fixed networking protocols and standards. So this makes it challenging to understand. The goal of this tutorial is to demonstrate how things are supposed to work, to also gain, uh, show you how to gain visibility into how it is working, and learn how to debug networking issues in Kubernetes as a result, and application issues that could have a networking aspect to them. So what I plan to cover here, I'm gonna do a brief introduction to general networking, um, network namespaces and container networking, mostly to make sure that we're on the same page and that I can use terminology without too much confusion. Then we're, I'm going to focus on Kubernetes services, do a little dive into Flannel with VXLAN encapsulation, and then take a tour of Calico using IP over IP encapsulation. So who's this for? Who should be attending this? So first, I think anyone who sets up clusters and needs to know how they work. Uh, it'd be hard to be in a position where you have to bring up a cluster and then not know anything about the networking, just have to rely on it magically working for you, especially if you're bringing up on bare metal hosts or in a, um, a less uh, packaged environment than perhaps one of the cloud providers you know, easy scale up Kubernetes services. I also think that developers who want to understand the limitations and advantages of how networking works in Kubernetes, um, I, I have had various roles over the years and in my roles as a software developer, I found that if I don't understand what's going on in the layers below my code, it's often hard to understand problems that come up in those layers or whether there's a problem with my application code or with the hardware, operating system, networking, whatever. So understanding how things work can help. And then, you know, understanding, for example, can you send uh, non-IP protocols to other pods? Things like that is useful depending on what you're trying to develop. Then I also think operations and network engineers who either are in charge of keeping things running and may have to debug them, uh, or just that, you know, need to be able to understand cluster networking so that they can do their jobs, whether it's configuring network equipment that the cluster uses, whether it's configuring networking on the hosts, whether it's figuring out when things have gone wrong. And, you know, it's a classic problem that your software developers want to say, hey, my code isn't working, I think it's a network. So you need to understand how the network is supposed to work so that you can tell them, no, it's actually your code. Um, I do expect a working knowledge of basic networking and Linux tools here, mostly because I can only teach so much without taking up all the time of introductory material. So the environment that I, I'm planning on teaching in. Um, first, if you want to follow along, there's a repo here on the slide that you uh, will want to clone. It's in GitHub, and uh, you can read the URL there. And then once you clone that, there are two options. I've designed it so that you can run all this with Docker and a tool called Footloose. Footloose is a tool from Weaveworks that lets you spin up a bunch of Docker images that look like virtual machines. And so this is the lightest weight way to get a Kubernetes cluster up and running on your machine. One of the problems I, I ran into when I was trying out different environments for this is that 
the amount of resources it can take to run several virtual machines at the same time, it can be intense. And I can't make any assumptions about what kind of hardware people are running with. So I can't be like, oh, well, everyone out there's got 32 gigs of RAM, so you know, no problem if we give four gigs to each VM. That's probably not a viable option. So this is the lightweight, lightest weight way to do it. The biggest downsides of this, other than having to have Footloose running, um, is that there are some weird interactions between the containers and the kernel uh, of the host. For example, IP tables. If the kernel of the host doesn't match the version that IP tables in the container expects, sometimes you'll see some weird results. So that can happen. Now, if you've got a working Vagrant and VirtualBox setup, I also have a Vagrant file that should work. That said, it has been tested to the bare minimum. So, uh, you know, if you're comfortable debugging it, great. If not, you can try either of these options. And if all else fails, uh, I'll be around to try to help people out during this, this talk. But I also think that maybe the answer is you watch me do it and try to figure it out later. Um, you probably can do a lot of these demonstrations on other Kubernetes clusters, but if you want to do the exact same stuff I'm doing in the same environment I'm doing it, then this is, this is the best way to go. Obviously, you're probably not going to get your production Kubernetes cluster and swap out the networking layer. So there are some things that would be hard to do in, uh, in environments that people are depending on. But certainly, if you wanted to spin up sets of VMs in different environments, you could probably replicate these without using my tools at all. Uh, I'm using K3S as my Kubernetes layer. It's a little bit different from vanilla Kubernetes. However, it's lighter weight and very fast to start up. And from a networking perspective, it looks very close. There's also a project K3D, which is uh, designed to run like K3S except in Docker. The only reason I didn't use that is because that leans on Docker for the networking, and therefore it's really hard to actually uh, look into networking tools. Whereas this, uh, using K3D and these footloose virtual machines, for lack of a better term, the containers that look like virtual machines, um, they actually think that they are basically virtual machines on a real network. So it looks a lot more like what you would expect if you were setting up actual hardware servers and connecting them with switches. So this seemed to be the right trade-off for me in terms of having an environment that is relatively lightweight and easy to start up, but also fairly true to how Kubernetes works. Okay, now I'm gonna do a demo of how to get the environment set up and running. Okay, let's talk about your options if you want to do these labs along with me. The first thing you'll do, regardless, is you'll want to clone the repo where I've put all the scripts. Super simple. Now, if you have a system where you have Docker installed and Footloose, uh, then you're, you're ready to go now. You can start running these scripts. I've got um, bootstrap.sh uh, bootstrap scripts in each of these folders to start up a Footloose cluster. If you're in an environment where that won't work or you need uh, to have a pristine outer environment, there's, there's a few cases where this will matter. For example, if you look at IP tables in a um, Docker-based virtual machine run in Footloose and your kernel doesn't match what's in your host machine, you sometimes get some weird results. These are fairly small uh, issues, so um, the lightest weight way to run this is with Footloose, but if you need more, you can run Vagrant up, and there's a Vagrant file. It's got a plugin. It's expected to use VirtualBox. Uh, it's set to use three gigs of RAM. I, if any of these things don't work for you, it may not work out. Like all sorts of weird stuff here. Um, in this case, I don't have VirtualBox on this this VM, but you can run Vagrant up, Vagrant SSH. So after you run Vagrant up and then Vagrant SSH to get into the machine, assuming everything works, you can then become root because Footloose is going to get uh, unhappy with you if you're not root, and then CD into the labs directory.
And I'm not in my Vagrant machine right now, so that, that folder doesn't exist. But slash labs will have mounted the Git repo you started from. So you will have all the same folders that you would have if you were just sitting in that cloned repo and running this through Footloose. Either option works, like I said. Footloose directly is going to be the lightest weight version, but if for some reason you need a compatible image on the outside, that Vagrant box uses Debian 10, which is the same image that's used in the Footloose uh, Docker-based VMs, fair quotes. And so that will make sure that the uh, host kernel and the guest kernels are compatible and you won't see anything strange. Okay, now let's cover some basic networking concepts just so I can refer to them later. Let's talk about how encapsulation works in networking. Uh, in general, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm gonna assume we're talking about IPv4 over ethernet. Um, IPv6 isn't super common yet and ethernet is the de facto standard for just about everything. So let's say we wanna send a packet via, let's arbitrarily say UDP, could be TCP just as easily. But we start with some data and then we wrap that in a UDP packet. So there's a UDP header and then a payload of data. And then the UDP uh, or TCP portion has the source and destination ports. That's part of the UDP or TCP level, uh, which is layer four. We then get that UDP packet and we stick an IP header on it. That's layer three in the, the networking stack. That has the IP addresses, source and destination. And this is the level at which routing happens. Then we stick a layer two ethernet header on top of that. And what this is used is to get your packet to the next hop on your local network. So uh, you either know the final destinations on your local network and address the ethernet packet to that destination, or you know what the next hop should be and you address your ethernet packet to that hop on your local network. When the packet gets to, its, to the, the next hop, if it's destined for that machine, then the ethernet packet, uh, ethernet header is removed, the IP packet is taken out and it's handed to the IP stack on the, uh, on the machine to, to route to whatever process or the kernel or whatever needs to, to get that packet. If it's just an intermediate hop, it'll look at the IP packet, figure out what the next hop should be to get to that destination, which may or may not be the final destination, but it's the next hop that is reachable in the local network and it will put a new ethernet header on there with its address as the source address and that next hop as the destination address. So ethernet packets only last within a local network and the IP packet may be carried along in several ethernet packets along its way to the final IP destination. Okay, now let's talk about Docker or more generally container networking. So Docker allows you to run a process with various forms of isolation from the host operating system. But for our purposes, we're really worried about network isolation. Um, the other, method, other parts of it don't really matter for a talk on networking. So Docker containers are run in network namespaces. This means that they don't have access to the host network adapters by default. And network namespaces allow you to isolate uh, networking functionality. The, there's a default uh, network namespace, often referred to as the root network namespace. And that's where everything is by default unless you put it in a different network namespace. So let's talk about how Docker works in, in bridge mode. We have a node, it's got its root network namespace and I'll say it has an ethernet adapter, eth0. When Docker comes up, it creates a bridge device generally called Docker0 and it allocates a block of IPs to containers. Uh, the defaults 172.17 uh, slash 16, so the, that means the last two octets are available for containers. Um, in this bridge device, it operates like an ethernet switch running in software. So that bridge gets attached to the host network interface, and Docker will create a new network namespace for each container it's trying to create. I'm putting two here just to demonstrate a little bit better. Now Docker will then create a virtual ethernet pair this is two devices 
that are effectively connected by a pipe. Um, you put data in one, uh, one of these devices, it comes out the other. Very simple. So it attaches one of the devices to the Docker Zero bridge, and the other moves into the container's network namespace and names it ETH0 within that namespace. It then gets assigned an IP from the range of uh, IP addresses that, uh, that are associated with that bridge. And then this means that the different containers have interfaces within the same subnet but with different IPs so they can talk to each other across that bridge, just like two devices on the same subnet with different IPs can talk to each other across an ethernet switch. Uh, traditionally, Docker doesn't really expose those container IPs to anything off the host containers are on. Now, there's, there's all sorts of solutions for this, and like, Docker Swarm obviously has some solutions. You can do port forwarding, but it's not really part of the base Docker functionality. Um, so getting traffic to and from containers on, on other machines is one of the problems that Kubernetes needs to solve to make this useful across a cluster of machines. Okay, now let's take a look at container networking uh, at the command line. Okay, so let's take a quick look at how these interfaces work in the real world. This is a fresh Alpine VM. You can see if I run IP adder, there's a loopback and an Ethernet interface. Pretty standard. Eth0. If I go ahead and install Docker, and then I start it, you'll see we now have a Docker Zero interface. And if I run bridge control show, you can see it is in fact a bridge called Docker Zero. Let's try creating a VM. So let's just run an Alpine VM and have it sleep. Okay, if I run IP adder, you can now see there's a new virtual ethernet interface. It's interface number five, and then it ends with at IF4. This will be interesting. So um, another thing we can look at, if we look at the bridge, we now see that this same virtual ethernet interface is attached to it. Now what happens if we exec into that container? Okay, I'm inside the container. You can see inside here, we have an interface. It's just ETH0, but it says at IF5. And note it's listed as interface 4. This interface 5 in the root namespace, network namespace, is a virtual Ethernet device, and it says at IF4. These are two halves of the same pair. So anything that you send out this interface actually goes through this virtual Ethernet interface to our bridge. And you can see another example of this. If I go and create a second Alpine container, you can see we now have another virtual Ethernet interface. We now have two interfaces attached to our Docker Zero bridge. If I go into this new container, you can see it says it's interface six, ETH0 at IF7. Interface seven in the root network namespace is at IF6. So you can see that these are the two halves of this pair. Another thing you can look at if I was to look at inside that other container, you can see its IP address is 172.17.0.2. From this container, I can go ahead and ping that. And what happens is it can reach that other host through the bridge. Uh, they're on the same subnet, so they, because they're on the same segment, there's actually an ARP request that goes through if I do a uh, I show my IP neighbor table, you can see that I see that 172.17.0.2 IP address, and I've got 
a MAC address for it. That is what we see. In fact, if I look in the other container, that is the MAC address it showed there. So you can see that um, just like two devices plugged into a switch on a normal network, these two containers can see each other across the bridge. Okay, let's talk about IPs. So there's really three main groups of IP addresses in Kubernetes. Node addresses, pod addresses, and service addresses. Um, for node addresses, it's pretty simple. Every, every node, every machine needs an IP address. This is used for nodes to talk to each other and the outside world, and it exists before Kubernetes is set up. It's really outside the scope of Kubernetes, and it's assigned by some outside process. Uh, you know, DHCP is an option, can be manual. Um, a cloud provider might just magically assign it somehow, and you just know it has an IP when it boots up. It doesn't really matter. So pod addresses. Um, to review how Kubernetes works, in Kubernetes, a pod consists of one or more containers sharing the same network namespace. So they have that same virtual Ethernet device as their EVE0. In the Kubernetes network model, uh, every pod receives its own IP address, and the idea is that all these IP addresses are globally routable within the cluster. So any pod can talk to any other pod no matter what machine it's on. These addresses are going to be allocated through the IPM functionality, IP address management of the CNI, container network interface plugins you're using. The most basic method is assigning a subnet to each node and then allowing that node to just hand out IPs from that subnet because it knows which ones are in use on, on itself. And so it requires very little coordination other than assigning a unique subnet when the node gets set up in the first place. Sometimes networking plugins will do something fancier like allocate dynamic IPs. Um, the Kube API server process has a cluster CIDR flag, which tells uh, Kubernetes what the range of expected pod IPs are across the cluster. Okay, now services. A Kubernetes service is an abstraction over a set of pods. It's something that you can talk to and get a pod behind it without having to know how many pods are there, or if there's even more than one, if it's on your host or a different host, doesn't matter. All non-headless services will have a cluster IP assigned to them. Um, these cluster IPs are handed out from a pool based on uh, this kube API server flag, service cluster IP range. And the API server takes care of this. Generally, the networking plugins aren't involved in IP address assignment for services at all, because these services have to be globally assigned uh, within the cluster anyway. A service has one IP in the cluster. So um, the, the API server will tell the kubelet processes what the service IPs are and what the endpoints are for them, and then the local networking stack on each node gets to be configured to support that service. Okay, let's go take a look at it. Okay, let's talk about getting the Footloose cluster up and running and look into how services do uh, routing to pods through IP tables. So this is the repo that we checked out. If you look in here, we've got a calico directory and a flannel directory. We're going to start in flannel. And so you can see here we have a bootstrap.sh file. You can see here we have a bootstrap.sh file and a footloose.yaml file. First, let's look at the footloose.yaml. So this is the configuration for the footloose cluster. Now, this spins up a bunch of uh, Docker images as if they were VMs. So it gives us a very lightweight way of having a cluster of VMs. Just to show a few things here, there's a cluster name. <clears throat> I'm calling this Footloose K8S. You tell it how many machines to create. This is designed for creating sets of homogeneous machines. So we're creating three machines. We're using this Debian temp image with a few extra things I've built into it so you don't have to download them later. All the nodes are going to be named node 0, 1, 2. Um, we need privileged for some, uh, some functionality of the OS. It's going to use a Docker network called footloose-cluster. And the rest of this is sort of boilerplate. If I look at bootstrap.sh, this is the script you can run to bring this up. It creates the Docker network. It will pull the image just to make sure you've got the latest version. 
It runs footloose create, which by default will use footloose.yaml to configure it. Once it's created the cluster, I use footloose SSH to shell into node zero and I run the K3S installer so that that gets set up as a master. We're using K3S because it's a lighter weight distribution of Kubernetes. And while it's got a few quirks, such as it doesn't use etcd by default, um, it's a compliant Kubernetes distribution and its network behavior is very similar to what you would expect from a normal Kubernetes distribution. So it's a pretty good tool for this purpose. After we set up the master, there was a process to get the node token from the server, which is what you need to authenticate uh, agents or worker nodes against that master. And then we install K3S on the two worker nodes using that token and pointing them to node zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the bootstrap script. So the first thing that popped out, that long string, is just the ID of the network Docker created. Uh, it pulls the image. Fortunately, I already have it pulled, so you don't have to wait very long. You can see it's creating the three machines, and you can see how quickly it does it. This is why I'm using Footloose. It's running the initial installer, running on the second node, and on the third node. We're already up and running. We can now footloose SSH root at node zero, and we are now on node zero. And just to prove it worked, okay, so you can see I can run kubectl, uh, get nodes. Right now, it's the master node's fully up. Node one is not ready all the way. Okay, node one's ready, node two's not ready. Okay, so. We now have three nodes. You can see they've got IP addresses 172.19.0 and then 2, 3, and 4. And just to prove that things are running, you can see that we've got a bunch of stuff running in kube system that it started by default. So now, Let's apply this hello Kubernetes YAML file I've got. What this does, it creates a service and three web servers behind it. And it creates it in the default namespace so I can just get PO and you can see those are getting created. Let's get the service. You can see here's the hello Kubernetes service. It's got a cluster IP, that's its IP. And it uh, takes requests on port 80. So standard HTTP. Okay, our pods are running now. Another thing we can do is instead of get service, we can get endpoints. And you can see that we have these three endpoints behind that service. If I get the service IP, and I curl it, See, so we get a page back. Now, the part that's interesting here is it gives you its pod ID. It's the main reason I use this image. So you can see, if I keep running it, I can see three different pod IDs I end up getting. So I know that by hitting that service IP, I'm getting to all three pods on the back end. So the next question is, how does that happen? And the, the standard way of doing that in Kubernetes is through IP tables. There's a few other solutions out there, but uh, most Kubernetes installations right now will, will be using IP tables. So let's take a look at the NAT table. And in particular, let's look at Kube service. Okay. So we've got a chain called Kube services. And you'll see if we look down here, 
we have some relating to Hello Kubernetes. Now, this kube mark mask one, we'll talk about in a little bit, but just recognize that this only gets hit if the source is not in the pod network. So if, you, if we scroll up and look at these pods, they were 10.42. whatever. So this is saying if it's not in the 10.42 network, which means it's not coming from the pod network, we're going to hit this path. Because if the destination is our service IP, um, we're going to want to tag this to do some masquerading later. If it is a pod, we don't need to do the masquerading. This next one says anything going to the service IP goes to this chain. Well, let's take a look at that chain. So this chain has three, uh, three rules in it. And you may note we had three pods. The first one gets hit with a random probability of one third. So there's a one in three chance you'll go to the first one. If you don't go to the first one, you only have two pods left. So there's only a 50% chance to go to the second. And then if you fall through both of those, you always go to the third one. So let's take a look at these. So the first one here, it's also got a mark masquerade rule. This one is the pods IP, that we're, the destination. So what this next rule does, it's a, it's a DNAT, so destination NAT. It says, hey, if we made it here, we're gonna change the destination from the service IP port 80 to the, this pods IP port 8080. The reason we have this masquerade that matches at the source address is the same as that pods IP, is that if a pod tries to talk to some service IP, the destination gets changed back to itself and it gets that packet. When it tries to respond, it's gonna go, I know exactly how to get there and try to send it locally. It needs to go back through the NAT process or else when the return packet comes back with an address that's not expected, it, things are gonna get really confusing. So this makes sure that it gets routed back through the host uh, networking stack. Okay, so as you can probably imagine, if I look at another one of these, I will just see a different pod IP. So this one's .1.4. And if I grab the pods again, You can see that 10.42.1.4 is the one running on node one, 10.42.0.7, that's the one running on node zero. If I pulled up the last one, it would have 10.42.2.3. So this is how it uh, gets for a destination service IP, the networking stack randomly picks one of the backends. One other thing just to show the details of what happens with the, um, the marking and masquerading. And I guess I should also pull up this. So if any of those kube mark mask rules get hit, it will add hex 4000 to the mark. And then when you get to the post routing chain, it will masquerade if it, the mark matches uh, 4000 hex. Uh, this random fully thing is nice in terms of it, it forces the networking stack to use random source ports. So, um, you know, the cases where you have one pod talking to another pod, things are fine because the address will get translated on the way out, get to the destination pod, and then when, uh, when the traffic needs to come back, it'll come back, uh, the, the, nat will be the natting will be reversed, and the original pod won't know it's talking to some other IP. But 
if the traffic was from outside the Kubernetes cluster, or you know, not a pod, then we probably need to force it to go through the current node just to make sure that it's handling uh, both directions of traffic so it can reverse the NAT. And if it's coming from the destination pod itself, we need to sort of force it to go through the node so it doesn't try to take a shortcut and uh, skip that, that NATing phase. So that's how services work with IP tables. Okay, let's talk about Flannel a little bit. So Flannel is one of the earliest networking plugins, and it's a decent choice for small clusters. There are some issues when you get too large in terms of having to make sure your ARP table size is large enough, and um, it's really the same reasons why you don't make one Ethernet uh, subnet or you know Ethernet LAN too big. But for small to medium-sized clusters, just fine. It's also the default for K3S, which makes it a great place for us to start because we don't have to do anything special to configure it. Uh, Flannel runs on layer two, Ethernet, and the networking stack. So all the pods can talk via Ethernet as opposed to only IP. So you don't have to necessarily use an IP-based protocol to talk between pods. You can actually encapsulate non-IP uh, stuff between your pods. Flannel uses uh, a pod subnet that's statically assigned to each Kubernetes node when it comes to IP address management. So uh, pod IP allocation decisions are local to the node, super simple. The default encapsulation for Flannel is VXLAN, which involves wrapping a layer two ethernet packet inside a UDP packet. So you have your IP packet typically wrapped in ethernet, which then gets wrapped in UDP, which gets wrapped in IP, which gets wrapped in ethernet. There's a lot of pieces there, and then VXLAN has a little bit of header in that UDP packet. It's, it's a little complicated. Um, it adds some overhead, but it works pretty well, and that way you can transport raw Ethernet packets between pods. Okay, let's dig in and take a look. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a look at how Flannel works. First, let's take a look at the interfaces we have. You can see we've got a Docker Zero, but that's actually just a uh, leftover from having Docker installed. It's not actually being used right now. We have an interface called Flannel One, and we have an interface called CNI Zero. And then you can see all of our normal uh, virtual Ethernet interfaces. So let's take a quick look at our bridges. So you can see Docker Zero is a bridge, but it's not really doing anything. <clears throat> CNI zero is actually the bridge that this Kubernetes cluster is using. And you can see that the virtual ethernet interfaces from all my pods are attached to CNI zero. So what happens if one pod tries to talk to another? Let's look at the routes. Okay, so there's a couple routes here we can look at. Um, the first one, the 172.19. 172.19 is the network that the nodes are on. So this is the route that they take if we're talking node to node. In this case, you can see this node is dot two. So if it's trying to talk to the other nodes or dot three or dot four, it'll go out eth zero. Makes sense. We can ignore the Docker zero one, because like I said, that's not really not really being used. So 10.42 is our pod network. And it just so happens that 10.42.0.0 is attached to this node. In fact, I can go take a quick look at the node information and you can see the pod CIDR is 10.42.0.0 slash 24. So slash 24 means only the last octet changes. So everything on this, all the pods on this node are going to start 10.42.0. So if we open up that route table again, 10.42.0 is going to go to CNI0. That's our bridge. So that makes sense. If a packet is destined for a pod on this node, 
we send it to the bridge and the bridge will figure out which interface it goes to to get to that pod. Now, if we're looking at a pod on a different node, those will be 10.42. dot something else, um, dot one and dot two. And you can see that both of these route via device flannel one. So the question is, what does flannel one do? So by default, flannel uses VXLAN encapsulation. VXLAN encapsulates entire ethernet frames. It gets them and it sticks them in a UDP packet that it then sends to the other side. So the question here is, how is this all gonna work? Let's see if we can demonstrate it. First, let's take a look at our what we've got going on. I killed my pod since last time. So let's go ahead and get those installed. Okay, so those don't have IPs yet, but it looks like we'll get one on each node, which is perfect. So our node zero one is gonna be this guy. I guess while I'm at it, take a look at the services. That's our service IP. Okay. So, are our pods up yet? Great. So let's see what happens if I, in a different interface, let's show you what I'm doing here. This is T-Shark. So this is a terminal version of Wireshark. Now, um, there are several tools you can use for uh, capturing packets on the terminal. TCP dump is probably the most standard. Uh, ngrep is another one, especially if you're great if you're looking at text-based network traffic and looking for like strings in a packet. Uh, T Shark is, like I said, the, the terminal version of Wireshark, so it's got a lot of extra capabilities, um, which is which I'm going to take advantage of here. So you may wonder why I'm looking at port 8472. Uh, you'll see in a moment. Okay, so our pods are running. So let's do a kube control uh, exec. Let's go into the pod locally because we want to see stuff on this node. So I want to make sure I don't uh, totally involve unrelated pods. And then let's just do a curl, uh, use the service IP. And for fun, let's go ahead and grep for. Hello, Kubernetes. And that's when I remember that I don't have curl installed. Okay, that's clean. So let's take a look here. So we've got a bunch of packets. Um, so the node I'm on, so node zero has the IP address ends in dot two. It tried to talk to uh, this guy, which is node one, and I sent a UDP packet. And the UDP packet came back, and then sent another one, and sent another one, Another one back, another one back. Um, this node sent one, sent another, received one, sent one. Okay, so you look at this and you think, what in the world's going on here? This isn't very useful. Uh, and that's true. So what we're seeing here is the VXLAN traffic. By default, uh, Flannel's going to use port 8472 for its VXLAN traffic. But as you can see here, all we can tell is two nodes are exchanging UDP packets. So when you're trying to debug what's going on in a network running flannel, you have to dig a little deeper because right now all you can see is packets are flowing between two nodes and in a decent sized cluster with a lot of pods doing a lot of things, you're just gonna see a ton of UDP traffic and have no idea what's talking to what. So let's try this again, except I'm going to add something else. This tells T-Shark that things on UDP port 8472 should be considered VXLAN. 
and T Shark knows about VXLAN, so that works. So let me try this. Okay. Now, when we look at this packet capture, you can see it's showing, I should probably come up here and check, our, no, our pod on node zero that we're running the request from has this 10.42.0.9 IP. And we, were, we sent that request to the one on node one. So we should be sending from 0 0.9 to 1.3. So sure enough, 0 0.9 sent a TCP send packet starting a connection to 1.3. Uh, we got a SYN ACK back, which is the next part in the handshake. An ACK gets sent, and then because uh, T Shark and Wireshark have advanced packet dissectors, they can dig in there and go, hey, this was actually an HTTP request getting slash. And then you can see that we got a response of a 200 OK. And then the connection got torn down. So by actually telling it to get these UDP packets, interpret them as VXLAN, we can see what's inside them. And for an extra level of uh, detail, we can use dash capital V. Now I'm only gonna capture two packets here because this is really verbose. So let's run another one of these. Okay, lots of stuff. Let me just scroll to the top. So it captured a frame. So it captured an ethernet frame. Okay, everything's pretty much ethernet at the, at the lowest level here. Inside the ethernet is an IPv4 packet. Okay, sounds good. And you can see this is between two node addresses. Inside that IPv4 packet is a UDP packet. I'm going to port 8472. Hey, look, it interpreted that as virtual extensible local area network or VXLAN. And so you can read the details of VXLAN packet. There's not a whole lot of data there. The main thing that you might care about if you run multiple VXLAN networks is that the VXLAN network ID, VNI, is right here. So the VNI of one. Um, that's a default. You can change it if you have multiple VXLAN networks, but uh, that, that helps you separate traffic if you need to. Inside the VXLAN packet is an Ethernet packet. Remember, VXLAN encapsulates layer two packets, so it encapsulates the entire Ethernet packet. This is interesting because there's some protocols you can't run over IP alone. So things that rely on like multicast or um, you know, like DHCP, you can't run over IP. It runs over, uh, over Ethernet. So we have an Ethernet packet inside our VXLAN packet. I don't feel like looking up all the MAC addresses, but we could, and it would, we'd be able to make some sense out of them if we did. But you can see inside the Ethernet packet is an IP packet, and this one is going between pod IPs. So we had IP packets between the nodes, that had UDP payloads that were interpreted as VXLAN that had Ethernet packets that had IP packets between the pods. And you can see also um, that inside this IP packet is TCP because uh, HTTP requests are TCP. So VXLAN uses UDP on the outside, but when you dig all the way in, you're actually seeing TCP packets in the middle. And then T Shark can give you all sorts of information. And then here we have the next frame, which is another Ethernet packet with another IP packet in it. This one from our destination node back to the node we sent the request from. Inside that's a UDP packet going to port 8472. Note for um, VXLAN, it's always a destination port is 8472. The source port is random, or at least consistently defined. It, the source port can be anything. Here's our VXLAN uh, information that we found inside the UDP packet. Inside that, another Ethernet frame, another IPv4, uh, IPv4 packet with uh, 
the source being the uh, pod that was running the HTTP server and the destination being where our client was running. Inside that's a TCP packet. Now in this case, the source port's 8080 because we, we made a request to 8080 and it's sending a response back. And you can see that this one is a connection established acknowledged SYN plus ACK packet. So the first one was the SYN packet establishing the connection. This one was the SYN ACK packet back. So you can go through and you can uh, pull apart all these layers and see the uh, each individual piece of it so that if you ever need to debug this, I mean, in many cases, if you just tell a tool like T-Shark to interpret the packets it sees on uh, UDP port 8472 as VXLAN, then you can at least see what's inside, and that's usually what you care about. But if you really want to know everything that's going on, you can actually dissect the whole packets, um, and you can also do this by saving a PCAP file and loading it in Wireshark if you don't want all this information spewing to your console. And uh, you can use that to see everything that happened inside. So you can see the outside packet, the VXLAN information, and the inside packet. And you know you can also use this to display the payload if you need to. And that should cover uh, the basics of Flannel and VXLAN. Now on to Calico. So Calico is easily the most common networking plugin uh, with Tigera, which is the company that behind it, claiming that's in use to some degree, uh, at least implied for network policies in most cloud provider Kubernetes environments. Uh, runs at layer three, IP in the networking stack, so only IP traffic can be encapsulated and everything is routed. There's no way to broadcast ethernet packets across your Calico, um, uh, your Calico layer. For IPAM, Calico actually, each node goes and asks either the Kubernetes API server or its own etcd cluster for a block of IP addresses that can allocate out but it can keep going back for more blocks of IP addresses as needed. So it is nice because it lets you dynamically adjust how many IP addresses are allocated to each node. And then as far as encapsulation, the default encapsulation for Calico is IP and IP, which involves wrapping a layer three IP packet inside an extra IP header. So it's very low overhead. All you need is an extra IP header, not even TCP or UDP and definitely not an extra ethernet header. Um, but it can only encapsulate IP packets. Literally, the, the protocol definition says this, there's an IP header, and inside it is an IP header, which then may have TCP, UDP, whatever inside of it. Okay, let's take a look. Let me show you how to uh, start up the Calico cluster. So first thing, um, back in your flannel cluster, you actually run to run footloose delete and that will tear down everything, and assuming you don't want to keep it running. Nice, easy way to clean everything up. Okay, so then if you went to the Calico folder, so under the uh, K8S NetLabs Git repo, there's a Calico folder. This one has a simple bootstrap Calico. So just like bringing up the Footloose one, or the, just like bringing up the Flannel one, it does everything for you. It creates a Docker network, it makes sure the image is pulled, it creates the cluster, um, and it does all the stuff required to get K3S to properly uh, initialize on the master and have the other nodes connect to that master. This one adds a few different flags, so if I look at, uh, well first, let's take a quick look. This Footloose Calico YAML, um, I name the, network, the cluster a little differently. I put Calico in front of the node names I use a different Docker network just to keep everything separate, but otherwise exactly the same as the last one. The bootstrap script, for one thing it passes this dash c footloose calico dot yaml to every footloose command to tell it which file to use. Um, I just wanted to keep that clear because I originally had these in the same directory. Then. It does the same thing but it did before, it SSHs into the first node, but it says flannel backend equals none and gives it a uh, cluster cider parameter. That is the only thing you have to do in order to tell it to not use flannel. And the cluster cider is needed for uh, Calico to understand what you do. 
And then we're going to SSH into the node. So same as before, foot loose, except I've got to use a dash C foot loose calico dot YAML and SSH root at calico dash node zero, because like I said, I, I named it differently this time. So first thing, do I have the nodes? Yes. And I can even see the IP addresses. This uses 172.20, so I've got here. Okay. Now you can see I've got a bunch of stuff that's in container creating and it's all on node zero. Well, that's because I haven't actually uh, set up Calico yet. Okay, so we'll do kube control, apply Calico k3s.yaml. So this is basically the Calico YAML that came from Calico or from Tigera. Um, it has one little tweak in it because you have to turn on IP forwarding in your pods for some of the stuff in K3S to work. So the difference between this and the default is just container settings allow IP forwarding true. So super simple. Okay, and now we actually have some pods starting up. And in particular, you can see you've got pod initializing on Calico node zero, one, and two. So we'll have to wait a moment for, for this to all start up because obviously until Calico comes up, we're not going to have a whole lot of luck getting the rest of our pods to come up. There we go. So now we have one Calico node running. And, oh. And this one running as well, and this one running. Great. Okay, so now we've got all the pods coming up. So this will have given us a Calico installation. So let's take a look around and see, see how this looks. One thing that's interesting is with Calico, it names its virtual Ethernet pairs, starting with Cali. Um, that's just a preference, I guess, but it makes it look a little different. But these things that all start with Kali, those are all the ones that were the same as the VETH uh, interfaces that we had in Flannel. Now you can see here, something that's interesting. If we look at our bridges, we've got Docker Zero again, which yet again isn't doing anything. Nothing's attached to it. So this is where Calico and Flannel differ. Calico does everything at layer three. It's IP based, routing based. So because of that, it doesn't rely on bridges. Whereas before, if you looked at the route table in Flannel, you saw one route for, towards the bridge for all IPs that are pods that belong to this node. And then you saw uh, other routes for the other nodes that said, hey, send them to the Flannel interface. Let's take a look and see what the routes look like here. Okay, so first thing, I should probably clarify this. Let me grab the pods and grep for node zero. You may note, aside from Calico, which came up with its own IP address because Calico wasn't giving out IPs then. We have 192.168.43 addresses. So Calico, you, tell, you give it a block of IP addresses that it can use. And then using etcd, uh, and, and depending on how you have it set up, it can either use the Kubernetes cluster etcd or it can have its own etcd. Um, it will each node will grab reservations from that block of IP addresses. The Calico nodes can grab as much IPs as they need. And in fact, if you look here, you'll see that we've got a route for 192.168.63.128/26. So we're, with Flannel, we gave a simple slash 24, 
which means the, the whole last octet is usable by the node, um, depending on how you want to count it, you know, 254-ish usable IPs there. Um, Calico actually grabbed two fewer bits of address space. So this one's only more like 64-ish IPs, but it can grab as many of those reservations as it needs. And then uh, if you run out of IP blocks big enough, it has a way where it can reserve individual IPs as needed. So what happened here is node zero appears to have gotten 192.168 dot 43 dot 0 slash 26 which makes sense dot 43 dot 1 dot 43 dot 2 dot 43 dot 4 etc node 0 got that block and then node 1 got this block dot 63 dot 128 slash 26 and node 2 got 186.64 slash 26. So they aren't even adjacent. So that's one thing. Each, each node dynamically grabs blocks and it can have more than one. So when we look at this routing table, what else do we see? So like for example, um, metric server is running here on, on 168.43.1. Well, we have a route here that says to go to this interface. So instead of having a, a route that says, oh, this is a local pod, go to the bridge and the bridge will figure out where to send you. This one actually has a route for each pod going directly to that pod's interface. Similarly, for things that nodes are on uh, node, node one, spit this out to be clear, calico node one has, is dot three. For things it knows that are on node one, it knows what the IP range is, or all the IP ranges that node one has reserved. So it sticks a route in that says, hey, um, for anything going to this pod range, we're gonna send it via node one, dev tunnel zero. Now, if we look up here at our uh, interfaces from IP adder, you can see we have this tunnel zero interface. And it is mentions link slash IP IP. This interface will encapsulate the packet in IP IP. What does that mean? Well, let's see if we can get an example of this. Okay, let's see what happens if we do uh, T shark Let's see what that does. Let's start up our hello kubernetes service again because why not? This is going to be our service IP. Forgot to tell what the capture on it captured on the IP over IP interface, which actually is useful because here you can see it went from a pod IP to a pod IP because that's what was sent to that tunnel interface. Make a lot of traffic here, so I was going to localhost. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this actually properly decoded this packet. Let's see if we can it's local local 
too much for random. Okay. So you can see that um, here I used dash capital Y, which instead of using a TCP dump syntax, which is very low level, it uses Wireshark syntax. And the reason I did that is because Wireshark understands what HTTP is. TCP dump really doesn't. So in this case, I told it to look for HTTP and it found this. Now let's see what happens if I decode it all the way. So you see everything, including the payload. If I come up here to the top, okay, it captures a frame, Ethernet packet, IP packet. Now this IP packet is going from host to host. Inside the IPv4 packet, you have an IPv4 packet. In fact, if you look at here at the protocol listed in the, the outer IP packet, it says it's IP over IP. So what happens is this gets the whole packet, the whole IP packet that you want to send, and just sticks another IP header on it. But if you look inside that IP packet, you don't see TCP or UDP. You see just another IP packet. It's a very simplistic way of doing uh, encapsulation. But you know, all your network devices are going to be routing the IP packet. So unless you've got some sort of stateful firewall that's looking for the type of protocol or you know, digging inside the IP packet, it's going to go, it's an IP packet. I know how to send that to the next hop. So inside the outer IP packet is the inner IP packet. This one has the pod IPs in it. And then you'll see the protocol inside that's TCP because it's because HTTP runs over TCP. So you've got, there's your TCP packet, destination port 8080, which is what the web server is running on inside these pods. And then you can dig all the way down, see it does a HTTP get. On the other side, the same thing, an Ethernet packet with an IP packet going between uh, the nodes. And then inside that is another IP packet going between the pods. The protocol in the outer one was IPIP, IP. protocol in the inner one is TCP. And then TCP packet, this is the response coming back from port 8080 and it has the response in it. There were more packets here. Um, because I told it to look for HTTP, it ignored anything it couldn't detect the HTTP in. So if you look at these packets, for example, um, the TCP flags, there's no sin uh, because the connection's already established. The connection got established and then it started sending enough stuff that t -Shark could say, oh, that's HTTP. So it ignored the early packets. But this is this way you can see what happens. You have an outer IP packet with an inner IP packet immediately inside of it with whatever your actual pay, you know, payload, TCP, UDP, whatever is in, inside that. But you can only encapsulate things that go over IP because the thing you encapsulate has to be an IP packet. You can't encapsulate, um, you know, IPX or Apple Talk or any of those things uh, that that didn't use uh, an IP as an outer, you know, that, that don't have an outer IP layer to them. Similarly, you can't do anything that's, that's raw Ethernet packets where you actually have to get the Ethernet headers to the other side. So the other part that's interesting about this is that how does Calico know where to send all the different packets, like what, what pods are on what nodes. And it actually runs a BGP daemon. So for anyone who doesn't know, BGP is a routing protocol and it's the most common one across the internet in terms of um, when different networks need to talk to each other, BGP is typically what they use. You might use a different protocol within your network, but if you want to exchange routes with Comcast or with AT&T or whoever, you're going to use BGP. That's the standard protocol for, for exchanging routes. So you can look here and see BGP, using the lovely Etsy services file, runs on TCP port 179. Um, so it's TCP, it's point to point, and with Calico, they connect in a full mesh. So let's see what happens if I, let's do TCP dump this time, just for fun. Let's look at EVE0 and let's look for port 179. 
Calico Node 0 on its BGP port sent something to Node 2. And presumably um, Node 2 connected to Node 0. That's why it's got an arbitrary port here. Let's see. Let's see what T-Shark finds. Have to give it a moment. They, they send messages occasionally, but it's not something that happens uh, non-stop. If things aren't changing the network, BGP shouldn't be chatting too much. Now, you can see there we got a BGP keep alive message. So this is how you can see that um, the different nodes all talk to each other over BGP. Um, oh great, so there we go. That's what we needed. So you can see we have a keep alive message that went between dot four and dot two and then the other way, and then between dot three and dot two, and then the other way. So this is showing you that node zero is talking to both of the other nodes. If you build a big enough network, Calico has ways you can put in route reflectors because uh, one of the problems you run into is that the number of connections you need is roughly on the order of n squared, not quite, but this gets a little bit out of control as that number gets closer to a hundred nodes or more. So there are ways of creating route reflectors which let a subset of nodes talk to one route reflector. Um, but that's something you would, you would want to do if you were having to scale this. But one of the nice things about BGP is it has been tried and true at internet scale for a very long time. And so the confidence that this will do what's expected is pretty high. And just for fun, I'm going to delete a pod. So you can see one's terminating, one's running. Okay, all done. So we didn't exchange any BGP information then because none of the routes actually changed. Remember when we look at the routes, you know, we have routes locally for the pods that are running on our local machine, but we only have routes to the subnets that these other, uh, these other machines have. So the only way that we could get this to, well, let's see if we can do this. This may or may not work, but hey. <laughs> so you can see I'm getting more and more of these individual routes. The other nodes still only have one block of IPs, but we don't have that many pods, so. Actually, since we haven't done this, So that's the that's the route for node zero right now. In fact, you see we still have BGP keep alive messages. Okay, we have now hit dot sixty three. There's a total of 49 pods running here, so it probably has a few IPs it can fill in that hasn't used yet. Like you can see, uh, 61 wasn't used yet. Here we go. We get BGP update messages, route refresh. Suddenly, our nodes are trying to There we go. That's what I was looking for. So 172.20.0.2 is node zero. And it now has too many for its IP block. So you can see it now got allocated another IP block, dot 64, 
which gives another 60, well, depending on how it uses it, it could use up to 64 uh, of those IPs, but sometimes you don't use the first and last, so it could be 62. So anyway, that's what we've got. And actually, didn't even realize, that's also node zero. So node zero now has three IP blocks. Node two has one IP block, and I'm on node one, so I can't see my own routes, but um, looks like it's still under control. So just for fun, I'm going to bring that back down so that my cluster doesn't fall apart. Okay, so that's Calico. It uses BGP to exchange routes. Each node gets reservations of blocks of IPs from either the Kubernetes API servers, etcd, or its own etcd. And it uses routes both to get to local pods and to get to uh, other nodes. And the standard installs encapsulating via IP over IP. Now, Calico also supports network policies. It also uh, supports different encapsulation as well. You know, you can actually get Flannel to run an IP over IP and you can get Calico to use VXLAN. It's just not their standard, uh, standard configuration. And so it made more sense to show you the standard configuration of the two and get to see both Flannel and Calico in action as well as both VXLAN and IP over IP in action. Okay, so that brings us to the end. Um, this has been a quick tour through container networking, service routing, and Flannel and Calico uh, in particular. Kubernetes networking is a huge topic, so any talk can only cover a small slice. Um, there's a lot of things I would love to go into. Uh, you know, for example, Cilium is fascinating. Um, there's a bunch of other, I mean, the list of networking plugins is tremendous. Uh, we could have used several other encapsulations. There's all sorts of new technologies out there. We could have dug deep into network policies, but um, there's only so much we can do in a limited amount of time, but hopefully this covered the tools that would make sense for looking into any of these things and at least would get you started on further exploration if you did want to go into these other topics. Um, this has been pre-recorded, so I can't sit here and answer questions live, but I should be available to answer questions throughout this, and if you need to reach me after the talk, you can email me at jeff at jeffpool.net. Thank you.